Hello, and welcome to Dungeon. I'm your host, Rob. And in today's video, we're doing my 1,000 subscription special. Yay! So we finally hit 1,000 subscribers. I'm excited about that. Uh, I remember there's a point when I had 37 subscribers. And when I looked again, like three or four days later, I had 34 subscribers. And that was a very depressing feeling, I tell you. Uh, you know, but, you know, generally it's been uphill since then. And still small, but growing, and that's exciting. And it's neat that I get to see a lot of the same names and stuff, making comments in a lot of my videos. And, you know, because the channel's small, I still recognize a lot of the names and stuff. And I just, that's fun and cool. So anyways, I was talking to my brother the other day, and he had a great idea, which was that I should do kind of just reviewing my history of Dungeons & Dragons. Because we were talking, and we realized it's been almost 40 years now, like 39 and a half years, essentially, since I first started playing Dungeons and & Dragons. And so I figured I'd talk about that and just kind of like my journey. Well, you know, we'll mention some of these other games that I've played over the years as well, of course. It's going to be more like my history with with RPGs. But obviously a large part of that is going to be Dungeons and & Dragons. That's where I started, and honestly, that's where I am now. So, you know, we've kind of come full circle, right? And when I say 40 years, it hasn't been 40 years of straight playing, obviously. There is, you know, like a good 15 year gap where I played no RPGs at all, of course, and, you know, just played a lot of computer games or whatever else. But, you know, we'll get to that. Uh, sadly, a lot of my original D&D books are gone now. Um, for like the hardcover books, I still have my Fiend Folio. I've got my original Player's Handbook. I've got not my original, but a Deities and Demigods. My original one did not have the Melnobonian or Cthulian mythos. I had a friend, and his had them, and we were talking about it. And then he started talking about how, because like, I read a lot of the Elric books and stuff, and he was mentioning how Elric was in Deities and Demigods. So I was like, I never saw him, you know? So he's like, yeah, yeah, it was on page like 86, I believe it was. Actually, let's just check that real quick, see if my memory still holds up after, you know, nearly 40 years. But uh, I don't know why I remember obscure things like that sometimes. It looks like I'm absolutely correct. Page 86. Oh. <laughs> Anyways, um, so yeah, I remember him telling me that. And I looked it up, and my book didn't have that. And then I noticed on the front, inside the front cover, I just dropped that. Uh, there was a note from uh, thanking Chaosium Incorporated for the use of the Cthulian and Melnibonian, or Melnibian, or whatever it's pronounced, uh, mythos. And I was like, huh, my book still has the note, but it doesn't have those. So I'm guessing something with Chaosium changed. But then I was in California. I moved there for a couple years and I was at a flea market and I found a copy of Deities and Demigods. So obviously I flipped it open to see if Cthulhu and Elric and all of them had made it into this version. And it had. And it said, Chrissy's. Chrissy's book, 1981, May 22nd. So, whoever you are, Chrissy, on the unlikely event you ever see this video, thank you for your copy of Deities and Demigods. It cost me $2, and it was money well spent. And who knows what happened to my version. I used to have both. But like I said, um, in one of the many moves, a bunch of my books ended up getting water damaged. And, uh, you know, because it was like, well, we were moving and unpacking, and, you know, the book, a lot of, like, crates and boxes and stuff just sat there for months and months and months. I didn't even know, so by the time I opened it, the books were like absolutely destroyed, and it's a real shame because I had uh, I, you know, I had way more D and D books, and I have things like you know like Warhammer and stuff, but you wouldn't know it to look at the shelf these days. You'd think I was more of a Warhammer guy, but no, it was always D and D. Oh, I will mention really briefly. Um, so this was not the first edition I played. I played the old Red Box D and D basic set. But this was the first book for Advanced D&D I ever bought. Um, I mentioned the Deities and Demigods one, where I found it at a flea market in California. Up in, uh, I think it was in Gilroy, California. And um, the Fiend Folio. I remember I grew up out in the middle of the country on like an acreage, and we were like miles from anything. Like the nearest town was about three or four miles away. But the, the town I went to school in, because that town was so small, it didn't have a school back then. It does now, but I think it's only elementary school. 
But anyways, the town I went to school in was like seven miles away. And then, uh, you know, the only like real town in the city was like 30 minutes away. And uh, of course, the city was like basically 50 minutes away, 60 minutes away, somewhere in that na neighborhood. So, you know, me and all my friends, we just like ride bikes to each other's houses and stuff. But we didn't really go anywhere. We didn't really do anything. So when I discovered Dungeons and Dragons, that's what we started doing which was, you know, because there was nothing else to do. We were in the middle of nowhere. We were all in the country. We didn't even live in these towns or cities, you know. And I think for my parents, they probably just kind of liked it because at least they knew where we were. We almost always played at my place, right? So everybody would come over. We'd play at my place. My parents could kind of see what was going on. We weren't out getting high or drinking or anything else that people do in small towns because there's nothing else to do. We were doing this instead, right? And uh, I think my parents kind of, kind of liked that a little bit, you know. I'm sure as I got older and never grew out of it, they were probably like, you know, we really wish Rob would find a girlfriend at some point. But, you know, that didn't happen until even later on. But whatever. Um, I think things kind of worked out for the best all, overall. And yeah, like, like I said, look, we lived in the middle of nowhere. So, and you know, we had three channels back then, right? So, you know, there was nothing to watch on TV except for maybe the odd, uh, like, Hockey Night in Canada or Oilers on ITV because I was that close to Edmonton. And, you know, that's basically what we had. So we had Dungeons & Dragons. And, uh, like I said, Fiend Folio came because my sister and I went and collected bottles on a Saturday and took all the bottles and cans we got, took them to the depot, and managed to get enough money to buy another D&D &D book. But anyways, so things kind of started when... Um, I remember, like, even when I was really young, like, even when I was, like, six or seven or whatever, right, before seatbelt laws were a mandatory thing and it was still only an option, I'd always, like, squeeze up between the seats in my parents' car and I'd talk to my dad about, like, like Greek mythology and other stuff that I thought was really interesting back then, you know, and uh, he'd tell me about different books that he'd read or whatever because my dad was a science fiction and fantasy guy as well. And, you know, then when I was in, like, grade four, our teacher read us The Hobbit and I just thought that was just, you know, the coolest thing ever it happened to school, pretty much. A um, bunch of, like, me and some of the others started getting into Lord of the Rings then, because it was, you know, even more adult, and even though we were just kids, of course, right? And then when I was 12 years old, I went on a scouting trip, because I was in Boy Scouts as well, and one of the other guys who was, like, a year older than me, this is how I know I was 12, because... Venture Scouts started at 14, and this guy was not a venture yet, but he was a year older than me, so he must have been 13, which means I was 12, right? Um, and he started telling me about this game he played called Dungeons and Dragons, and he was a big Lord of the Rings guy too, right? He really loved Lord of the Rings, probably even more than I did, honestly. And so he just, like, it just sounded so magical. The idea that I could play, like, all these types of characters, like elves and dwarves and everything else, and go on these great adventures. And I remember one of the things that really hooked me was the idea that you could, like, make up your own stories. You could basically do the Lord of the Rings or whatever else you wanted with your friends and make your own stories. And it, that just sounded awesome. And so I just pestered him the entire weekend to just tell me everything he could about Dungeons and & Dragons. And I hadn't even seen a D20 yet, and I was already obsessed, you know. So I remember I came home, and I was super excited about it. Uh, my family was rather poor back then. Uh, and so, like, I could tell my parents didn't really like the idea. Because if they bought me something, they're going to have to buy something for all my brothers and sisters, too. Because otherwise, it's not really fair. But I managed to work out a deal with them where they would buy me the D&D Basic set as, like, an early birthday present. Because my birthday was still a couple months away. And, of course, it was with the understanding that this was going to happen now. And I was going to get the, this now. But when my birthday came, there wasn't going to be a present. Because this was the present, Right. And I was totally cool with that. I did not care. So we got the red box set, which, you know, the basic set only covered levels one to three at the time. Um, and it came with the keep on the borderlands. And I swear, we lost more party members to the, to the Caves of Chaos. And probably, well, definitely more than any other dungeon, but maybe more than every other dungeon combined. Because we just ran this thing so many times, you know. And then, you know, uh, as we got the D&D Expert set, that covered levels 4 to 7, that was in the blue box. And then I discovered, um, because like, the later basic box sets were just not coming out, really, uh, because TSR had essentially moved to Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. So we discovered Advanced Dungeons & Dragons, which is similar, but 
there are a lot of differences still. And we just like moved over to there and never looked back, right? We started, you know, just buying all the books. And I remember I had like my one group of friends that I'd play with, which would be like me, my brother, my sister, and a couple of the neighbor kids who'd always come over. And that group, we would get together every single day after school, almost without fail. I mean, like year after year, six to seven days a week, we would just get together and play Dungeons and Dragons. And that's basically what we did, right? And then I also had some friends I made at school who also played Dungeons and Dragons. And so we'd start playing like three, four, five days a week even sometimes. And we'd just go to the French room on our lunch breaks and we'd play D&D. And then I still had the original group from Boy Scouts. And a lot of those guys, like because we were all out in the country, the scout troop was like just people from everywhere, right? So a lot of these guys didn't go to the same schools as us or anything else. We'd only see them at scouts, right? And, you know, you wouldn't have a scouting camp all the time. You might go two, three months. But whenever we went camping, we'd always do whatever the scouts are supposed to do during the day and, you know, make our whatever it was tower with, you know, two knots only or whatever it was, giant tripod things or build lean-tos or whatever else, right? And then at night, we would either, like, if we were doing lean-tos, we'd build, like, one giant lean-to because then we'd all cram into the lean-to and... By flashlight, we just played Dungeons and Dragons. Or if we were using tents, we'd cram into the biggest tent we could, and we'd have like 10 or 12 guys, and they were all playing Dungeons and Dragons. And like I said, some of these guys were like me, and they played a lot in their own groups. Some of these guys only played on scouting trips, you know, and that'd be it, right? But because of this, nobody really had like one character, right? Everybody had like essentially a stable of characters, you know? So I'd have like you know, 15 or 20 characters. I, I was probably about 50 characters at one point, like living characters, you know, not to mention the, the horde of characters who died. Because back then, Dungeons and Dragons was a very, very deadly game, right? Uh, you know, things like a Basilisk or a Medusa, you just either made your saving throw and didn't get turned to stone, or you failed it and you did. That was it, right? There was none of this like three-stage process like we have now. The, the rules were a lot more harsh. Things like Disintegrate, Disintegrate did zero damage. You either made your save and lived, or you failed your save and got disintegrated, right? <laughs> there was no damage part of it. See, so with Finger of Death, it was just, you know, these things were just outright kill players, right? You either saved and lived, or failed and died. That was it, you know? And, uh, it just made the game, like, really, really harsh and brutal. So, you, you know, you'd die a lot, right? And we didn't tend to get really a, a, attached to a lot of our characters, because you just saw so many characters die over the years, you know? But whatever. So we'd have a lot of characters each, and it was more like, you know, somebody would be like, hey, I bought this adventure. Because we, even though we made a lot of our own adventures and we were always making our own stuff, we played so much that there was no way you could constantly be like, you would have to spend all your time just making D&D adventures for you and your friends. So we you relied on store-bought modules all the time. And fortunately, back then, they were super cheap, right? But I still have some, some of the modules... Uh, did survive over the years. So here's my old Scourge of the Slave Lords. I've got some, uh, I've got some Dragonlance ones here and there. Uh, the Dragonlance Adventures, by the way, weren't exactly the best modules out there, but, you know, I like the Dragonlance books, so we bought the modules as well. And a lot of people were familiar with them. My old Ravenloft 2, I can't find Ravenloft 1. And, you know, there's more here. Oh, I've even got some Oh, look at this. I've got the Immortal Storm. Oh, that's from the old D&D basic set. Eventually, they got uh, Immortals, where you could literally play, like, characters of just any level. Well, yeah, I ended up with, like, tons of high-level stuff, too. Like, this one here is um, levels 15 and up, Test of the Warlords. That was from the Companion Ventures. This was also the Companion set, which was a follow-up to, like, the basic and expert sets. Uh, this was the Masters, which was after that. I mean, this is level 25 or 30. And the reason I have a lot of high-level stuff, we'll get into in a minute, was because um, basically the characters who didn't die eventually became, like, basically demigods. <laughs> uh, that was one thing about the, about the old school D&D. &D. Uh, it just kind of had, like, this weird balance, you know? But anyways, so like I said, uh, we had, like, all the guys, the scouts we'd play with. I had the guys at school I'd play with. I remember, too, um, even on the bus... Because, like, we lived out in the middle of the country, so the school bus would have to, like, come to all these different acreages. And our, like, our bus trip was over an hour to get to school. So we would literally play on the bus. And all the time, you know, somebody would roll, and the D20 would, like, fall on the floor and roll up to the front of the bus. And we'd have to, like, yell up and 
but then people were just kind of used to us and they'd like find our dice and just everybody would pass it back and nobody ever kept it or anything which was cool uh, it's just it different days back then I guess but anyways people would just pass the dice back and we'd just keep playing and like I said you know we just we were just always playing partly because there was nothing else to do out in the middle of the country let me make that very clear right um, but anyways so like I said at, because we played constantly at, oh yeah so the stable characters that's what I was talking about um so like I said, you wouldn't just have like one character and then you'd play that character in the campaign, right? To us, the campaign was basically just everything we ever did was like one giant campaign. We didn't really care if something was like from Greyhawk or Forgotten Realms or, you know, Keep of the Borderlands, which was in whatever set that was, in, whatever world that was supposed to be in. Uh, you know, we, we didn't care about any of that stuff. It was just all one giant game world in our opinion. It's probably, you know, the size of the, size of the sun practically. It was just a million maps all put together, you know, nobody cared. Uh, all of our characters kind of coexisted in the same world. It didn't really matter, you know. And so, you know, whenever somebody bought an adventure, they'd be like, oh, I've got this adventure for levels four to seven, right? And then you'd like flip through your book and be like, oh, I got this guy's level five. Uh, I got this guy's level seven. Uh, what alignment is everybody? Oh, well, I'm good, I'm good, I'm a paladin. Okay, well, forget my level seven guy, he was evil. Right, I'll go for my level five guy. Uh, he's a cleric. Do we have any other clerics? Like, you know, or what else do we need? What are we What are we looking for? And you know, then the guys with lots of characters like me would just kind of fill in the gaps. You know, like oh, we don't have uh, any healers at all. Okay, maybe we need a couple of those. You know, uh, and so that's just kind of how we played the game back then, right? You know, it was more about like just having a bunch of characters and whichever one was appropriate for that game, you just play it, right? And uh, eventually, of course, as we got older, I'm, and I want to make it clear too. We were just like complete power gamers back then. Our idea of role playing was rolling dice and playing. It was it had nothing to do with like being in character really, right? And a lot of this is because we started so young. I mean, I was like I said, like I was 12, almost 13. My brother was a year and a half younger than me. And then my sister who played with us was a year and a half younger than him. So she was like, you know, 10 or whatever when we were starting, nine or whatever, right? And she played with us all the time anyways, you know? So, I mean, none of us really, got into the role play aspect of the game at this point. It was all about rolling dice. We all treated it like it was a game of like collaborative monopoly essentially where we weren't trying to beat each other. We we're trying to work together, but it was definitely like an us versus the game type of idea. And we were trying to play the game to win, not to, you know, experience the adventure kind of thing, right? And I think that's kind of typical of uh, players when they first really start getting into this kind of stuff. Obviously, we kind of grew over time, right? But that's just kind of where we started, you know? So I had a very, uh, you know, power gamer type mentality. I wanted to build powerful characters and stuff. And, um, you know, that's just kind of how things went. And eventually, over time, we kind of got to a place where we were kind of sick and tired of all of our characters dying. And this is when we really started to, like, kind of, like, pull together as a team, right? And we started figuring, like, okay... You know, if we need to, like, we want these characters to, like, live because we really like this group of characters and they're really powerful, which is probably why we like them, of course. And so, like, up till then, you know, if you got, like, a Ring of Three Wishes or a Luck Blade or something, right? It's just whoever got the dice roll got that item, right? And then they'd use their wishes for themselves, you know? And this was when we were kind of like, no, if we get a Ring of Three Wishes, we need to save that ring. Nobody uses it. And we use those wishes for resurrecting all the dead characters in our party so we can bring them back to life, you know? And then, you know, as you start getting more powerful, you start getting spells like Resurrection and, you know, even Raise Dead, which was a very weak spell back then. It was a fifth level spell, but you came back with like one hit point and you basically just had to lay in bed for like a week straight, you know? It wasn't really something you do in a dungeon. It was more like you'd recover your body's corpse, you'd carry your buddy's corpse out with you from the dungeon, get him back to civilization, raise him, and then you'd have a, like a week of downtime while he tried to recover, you know? That was kind of how you used that spell. But we really started to see like a bunch of characters who all kind of as a group, and this was kind of like an actual party. It wasn't like just kind of the odds and ends and hodgepodge that we've been drawing up till then. And they started to get to like high level. And you know, all of us ended up having characters that got into the 20s and eventually the 30s. Because back in, in Advanced D&D, um, there was really no upper limit for humans. Like they had a lot of, like a lot of the demi humans, like the dwarves and elves. They all called them demi humans back then. They were halflings. They all have like character limits of how high they could go. But humans just said unlimited, and we thought unlimited meant unlimited. So you know, 
We had characters in the mid-30s and stuff by the time we finally finished. And that wasn't so bad, except that um, the real balance breaker was, like I said, like, A Ring of Three Wishes, while nice, isn't necessarily game-breaking. What becomes game-breaking is when your wizard gets high enough to get the wish spell and can cast it literally every single day. If all you're going to do with your Ring of Three Wishes is resurrect the odd party member when they die, and you're carrying that ring around forever, and then, oh, somebody died and can't resurrect them, I'm going to use one of my wishes on that. Oh, it happened again. I've only got one wish left now, but resurrect that guy too, you know? So that's two wishes down. But when you can cast Wish every day, that stuff kind of becomes immaterial. And back then, there were not a lot of good restrictions on Wish. Wish was a terribly designed spell. Uh, even today, it's the most powerful spell in D&D, and we all know it. But at least now, most players use it to duplicate eight to lower level spells. There's restrictions on what else you can do. If you go outside of like using it to duplicate spells, there's a one in three chance you just lose the ability to ever cast Wish again. And, you know, you don't really want to do that. So, these days, I feel like Wish is, while still being incredibly powerful, is in a much better place. But back then, really, the only restrictions you had on Wish was every time you cast a Wish spell, I think you aged like three years or five years. But because potions were longevity or a thing, that wasn't really a big deal. Like by the time you were 18th level and you could cast Wish every day, you probably had the ability to get potions of longevity whenever you needed them to, right? So that's not a big deal, really. And then the other thing was that the wording could sometimes be twisted because it said, like, wishes were technically granted by, like, a god or goddess or other divine being, like, even demon lords and arch devils and stuff in their home planes uh, basically were treated as lesser gods according to deities and demigods' rules, and they could grant wishes. But um, basically just whatever with the closest god that heard you grants the wish. And that could be okay if, in some cases, but in some cases, other cases... Uh, these beings might try to twist the wording, right? But, I mean, we had, you know, our players did not screw around. They would, like, go home, think about their wish, write it out, like, six times until they had the wording absolutely perfect. Because the thing was, they could, like, like, the wording had to still be followed, right, in your wish. So even evil gods, they'd still grant the wish, and they might try to twist the wording. But if your wording was really specific and really clear, there wasn't much that could really happen. And like I said, we had guys who'd like go home, write it out, write it out again because it wasn't perfect, rewrite it again to, to even refine it even more, you know, and like finally come up the next day and here's my wish. <laughs> they read it out, you know, and you're like, ooh, that's a, that's a very tightly worded wish bell. Congratulations, you know. So those were really the only restrictions. I remember there was a, a note at one point that said that you could use wishes to raise attributes back then. And it suggested you could use a wish to raise any attribute by one point. But once the attribute got to 16, to raise it above 16 required 10 wishes per attribute. And like I said, if you have a luck blade with one or two wishes or a ring of three wishes, that's not a big deal. But then your wizard can suddenly cast wish every day. And the, and the DM's like, okay, well, we have a month of downtime. What do you guys want to do? And the wizard's like, I cast 30 wish spells and raise my intelligence. And you're like, huh. Okay. <laughs> I guess you now have like 21 intelligence or whatever, right? And uh, that became a problem. Even worse, though, because I was like still naive and game balance wasn't really a finely tuned thing in our minds when we were like 14 or 15, uh, we allowed people to wish for more hit points. And that was really, really a bad idea. So, I mean, I remember we had, you know, wizards running around with, like, we capped people out at 24, 24 on their stats, and, the, and then gods and deities and every gods could get to 25. And we should have gone lower, but we really couldn't, because you had things like the belt of storm giant strength, which back then was 24 strength. And it, it seemed really unfair that you were like, oh, well, you can only get up to, like, 20 in any of your stats. Oh, unless the fighter gets a belt of giant strength, then he can go beyond that. But the rogue, he's capped out at 20, no more than that, you know. And, oh, the wizard, no, you can't get above 20 intelligence ever. And, you know, it just kind of felt like, well, if the fighter can get 24 off a belt of giant strength, you're telling me that, you know, the 100 wishes the wizards put together now, you know, to raise his intelligence isn't at least as powerful as that? Like, you know. So we let them go to 24 because that's where the belt of storm giant strength cut out. 
We're lucky there wasn't a belt of, of Titan strength, otherwise they would have been at 25. And then the leaders of Pantheons like Odin and Zeus and stuff all had 400 hit points back then. So we seemed we felt that was a reasonable maximum. But it wasn't, because then you had wizards running around with 400 hit points, and that was a terrible idea. However, I also want to say, a lot of our favorite characters were these high-level, godlike characters. And maybe because I also read a lot of comic books back then, we didn't really see it as a big deal, right? To me, like, if you're looking at, like, you know, you got some teams that are like, not very powerful and they fight regular stuff, right? Or you got a guy like Batman, who's a street-level hero for the most part. And yeah, he sometimes does big stuff, too, with the Justice League or whatever. But he's fighting guys like the Joker and Penguin and Bane and stuff. Why doesn't Superman fight Bane? Well, because Superman would destroy Bane in half a second, right? Superman has to fight, like, guys like Mongol or Darkseid or, you know, these other big gla galactic menaces and universal threats, even, or multiversal threats. And that's kind of how we treated our characters. Like, if you had a little 30-something wizard with 400 hit points and 24 in all their stats, uh, that guy's basically a god. So who's he fighting? He's fighting evil gods. He's fighting demon lords. He's fighting arch devils and stuff. So we had, like, multiple incursions into the Nine Hells. We were uh, intent on killing all the arch devils. We killed a couple of the weaker ones, but never got into the good ones. We got our butts kicked numerous times. We were not very strategic a lot of times in our approach. We just kind of, you know, I, I remember the one time, this was like a third attempt to uh, kill uh, all the arch devils of the Nine Hells. And we went in with like 14 player characters. And by the end, only four or five were alive. We did manage to recover a lot of the bodies, but we literally lost them like, like 25th level characters just died in that adventure. Never, never to be seen again, right? So, uh, you know, a bunch of the big ones made it out. They managed to bring some bodies with them. Because remember, you can't, like, wish to bring your buddy back to, to life if you're in the Nine Hells. Because who's going to be answering that wish? A bunch of Arch Devils. And they're just not going to grant that wish. So, you know, then you're like, ah, okay, well, guess we got to, you know, haul them back to the Prime Material Plane with us. But, like I said, because I loved a lot of these superhero type stuff, uh, we just realized, like, you know, Fighting high-level stuff is kind of cool. And so, like, I look back on it, and one of my favorite characters ever, uh, I'll, I'll tell her story real quick. Um, she was really a very generic character to begin with. And I don't really play evil characters that often, but because I had so many characters, I ended up making an evil sorceress, and because I was, like, 13 when I made her, I named her Morgan Le Fay because I was not very creative, right? Uh, eventually, though, we went on an adventure. My friend Travis ran called Expedition to the Barrier Peaks. And uh, spoiler alert for a 40-year-old module, if you didn't know by now, but the Expedition to the Barrier Peaks is a dungeon crawl through a crashed alien spaceship, including laser guns and power armor and everything else you can imagine that an alien spaceship would have, probably, right? And so my one friend Jason convinced us all that we should all play evil characters. So that's really why I decided to play Morgan Le Fay, right? So I, I'm like, well, I've got an evil wizard. Back then they were actually called magic users. So if I use the name magic user in this video, just remember, that's what we used to call wizards. I don't know why, because lots of people use magic, not just wizards, but that's what they were called back in the day, right? So anyways, I have my evil magic user, and she's in the appropriate level range, so I decided to play her. And everybody's playing evil party members. I think we have six characters in the party. And it was pretty rough going, i got to be honest with you. It was a tough adventure. But at one point, the party convinces me and the party's rogue that we find this giant swimming pool, but it's like really murky and we can't see in it. And they convince me and the rogue that we should go explore the swimming pool together while the rest of them wait. And the reasoning was because we were the two that didn't have like heavy armor, right? The rogue's wearing leather, I'm wearing robes. So we're like, yeah, okay, why not? That kind of makes sense, I guess, right? And, uh... So we leave the majority of our gear there because the DM, you know, wants to know, like, okay, well, what are you carrying, right? And I'm like, oh, I can't even bring my spell book in. It's going to get destroyed by the water. So I have to leave my spell book behind. So I go in. I've got, like, a wand of magic missiles and whatever spells I have left. And the rogue has whatever he has. We end up fighting an eye of the deep. And it's just the two of us. The rogue almost dies. I'm not doing too good. I'm, like, looking at my spell list. And I realize, like, really I have dispel magic and a lightning bolt and I don't really want to try casting a lightning bolt underwater because it'll probably kill us all 
So I was like, man, look, what am I going to do? So I used a couple of magic missiles on this thing and the rogue manages to, that to help me. And we managed to kill the thing. We get out of the pool and we realize all of our gear and our party members are gone. And then the rest of the party starts laughing. And this is when we realize they just stole all of our stuff. And the party's cleric had like this portable hole. So, you know, we're finding like lasers and stuff. He's throwing it all in the portable hole. All of our gear is now with the cleric in his portable hole. So at this point, the DMs just has to start like splitting the groups, right? So we got the one group who's got all of our stuff and he'll, have, he'll spend like 15 or 20 minutes with them doing an encounter or a couple of rooms. And then he kicks them out of the room and they send us in. And then he does some stuff with us for 15 or 20 minutes. And then he kicks us out and he brings the other guys back in. And he just keeps jumping back and forth like this, right? And he's trying to like juggle both groups. And he was a pretty good DM about this kind of stuff. Um, I thought he handled it quite well. And so me and the rogue, we're just intent on hunting these guys down, killing them all, getting our stuff back, right? And the other group, by luck, or bad luck, I guess, they run into a mind flayer who has like this laser turret trap. And I actually mentioned this in at least one other video, but they're coming down this hallway. Let's pretend my arm is the hallway. They're coming up this way. They get to like this turn. And when they go around the bend, there's this laser turret just set up like five feet from the corner. And as soon as it detects movement, it just starts firing, right? And meanwhile, way back here in the tunnel, there's a secret door with a room off it. And the Mind Flayer hears his laser cannon go off. It's like, oh, look at that. It comes running out of the room and attacks the party from behind. He just like, comes up behind them. And like the laser cannon kills one or two guys. The Mind Flayer himself kills another guy or two before they put him down. And at the end of the day... Well, I guess, I guess they only killed two, because there's me, the rogue, and then there's the two survivors. So I guess two guys died. So the laser cannon probably got one, the mind flayer got one, I think. Whatever it ends up being, the cleric, though, ends up being one of the ones who dies. And so at this point, the only survivors of that group are the elven fighter magic user. Because uh, back then, elves and dwarves and halflings were essentially the multi-classers, right? Humans were basically one class. Um, you could dual class, but it's kind of complicated. And you couldn't use the abilities of the other class until you were second class and surpassed it, whatever. But the only, like, multi-classing, really, was demi-humans, who actually had leveled all their classes at once, but had to split the experience equally between all those classes. So, you know, everybody else would be level 4, the elf would be, like, level 2 magic user and a level 3 rogue or whatever he'd be, right? And, and everything would be, like, all off balance. And back then, different classes needed different amounts of experience to level and stuff. So, you know, the rogue might be level 11 when the fighter is only level 8 and the wizard's level 7 or whatever. It was, it was interesting. But anyways, so, like I said, half the party dies. Half the other group dies, I should say. And uh, they do manage to kill the Mind Flayer. They take his security access card because he's got one of the black cards, which would get us anywhere. I think it was black. Might have been gray. Who knows? Uh, they take the laser turret, even though it's out of out of ammunition at this point, it's out of charges. They throw it into the portable hole and uh, throw all the cleric stuff into the portable hole, of course, because, you know, he's dead. <laughs> um, and me and the rogue end up finding them. They're in this room that the elf is almost dead. The fighter is still relatively healthy. and But the rogue's scouting ahead and he manages to find them. And they don't know he's there. So he kind of comes back. And we're trying to figure out what we're going to do because I have almost no spells left and I don't have a spell book. And so I can't really recover my spells either. And uh, we're kind of discussing it and, and we're kind of pooling our items. I'm like, okay, well, I still have a lightning bolt spell. I have a dispel magic spell and I have the few remaining charges of my wanted magic missiles. And the rogue's like, well, I have a potion of invisibility. And so we decide back then there was a peculiar rule with lightning bolt. If you hit somebody and then the bolt hit a wall, it would rebound right off the wall and come straight back. So you could technically hit a guy with the bolt on the way there, bounce it off the wall, and hit the same guy on the way back. So we decided that's what we're going to do, because they were like off in this corner. So we give me the invisibility potion, and I'm like trying to sneak in there. And then I start casting my lightning bolt. And they kind of see me, and the lightning bolt, but we, you know, we roll initiative, and uh, I end up hitting them with this lightning bolt. And the rogue, uh, or sorry, the, the elf just like flat out dies. The fighter, though, is still alive. And then... The rogue jumps him, backstabs him for like quadruple damage, and the fighter's still alive. And he like attacks the rogue, almost almost kills the rogue in, in a single round. Because the rogue was already pretty injured, right? And I just decided to unload every charge left of my water magic missiles because we're back to the top of the next round. 
And fortunately, we put down the fighter, we recover all of our gear, and the two of us make it out. And then in the very next adventure, because, you know, I have all these lasers, so I'm like, oh, this is a cool character suddenly. I'm going to play her more, right? I end up getting cursed, and my alignment gets reversed. So instead of being chaotic evil, I become lawful good. And the reason I mention this character specifically, and the reason I go into all this story about her, is because this was really like the first burgeoning experience for me of role-playing a character rather than just rolling dice and trying to win the game. Because I remember talking to the dungeon master afterwards, his name was Raymond, and I was like, well, you know, how do how does she become evil again, right? And he's like, well, you know, like a wish spell, remove curse would probably do it. It's like, but, like, why would she want to be evil? Like, she's good now. She probably doesn't want to be evil again. Maybe she even, like, feels real bad about all the terrible things she must have done in her life. And this was the first time I really started stopping and thinking, like, not what do I want for the character, but what would she as a person want? And she ended up becoming my favorite character, not just because she was powerful, although, you know, I was still young and that was definitely a thing in my brain, right? But also because I had this huge, like, redemptive arc where the character wants to try to, like, become a good person, like, kind of prove herself and stuff. And it was the first time I really started thinking about what does this character want to do and, like, you know, what kind of life does this person want to live, right? And uh, I ended up changing her name to just Morgana. And by the way, she ended up becoming essentially, oh, wherever it is, wherever my novel is that I wrote, uh, that's one of the main characters, the girl named Morgana. She's really changed a lot from that original character. But the core concept and the name have definitely remained, right? And that was kind of my first experience of trying to, like, play, like, an actual character rather than just having a bunch of stats and trying to win, right? So I, I credit a lot of that to, to that Dungeon Master as well, Raymond. Because it really kind of forced me to think, like, like just change the way I thought about the game, right? And uh, that was a really good experience for me. He's also the guy, by the way, I've told this story before, so I'll try to be really brief. He's also the one who once challenged me to make a wizard with no damage spells. And up till then, all my spells would basically be damage spells, right? I might have fly and teleport and dimension door, some other obviously good utility spells. But it was almost no damage, because that's what I thought wizards were for, you know? Fighters did lots of single target damage and, you know, rangers and guys like that. And then wizards did AOE damage. That was their point, I thought, you know? And then I started discovering how good, like, a lot of crowd control and battlefield control spells can be. And it really caused me to think about the game in a completely different way again, right? Um, so, you know, I kind of owe a lot to him, even though we didn't really play together that much, to be honest. But anyways, uh, I remember my sister had a cleric named White Star, and this was uh, this was hands down the most powerful cleric any of us had ever had. She made it into her like mid-30s as well. And I feel really bad, because I remember at one point, um, she ended up getting destroyed by like a sphere of annihilation, and we couldn't think of any way to bring her back, partly because uh, a lot of the other characters, like these weren't like, this was more like her plus the B team, I guess. This wasn't the Avengers of the Justice League team, this was like, you know, the second stringers, I guess. And they were still high-level characters. They were all in, like, their 20s. But it wasn't, like, the god characters, right? And they just didn't really have any method of bringing her back to life. And so I felt really bad because, like, this was a moment where, like, my sister had had a lot of fun. She was just playing the game. But when that character died, you could tell it was just never the same for her again, right? And that was really too bad. I should have just, like, fudged the rules or something because literally nobody else back then would have known, you know? And so I look back on it now and I'm just like, ah, that, that, that sucks. You know, you got a little 30 something cleric and you've put like years into this character and then they die and you're just like, mm. And uh, she still played after it, but I could tell, like I said, it was never the same. And, and bear in mind, as young as I was, she was three years younger than me. So it was kind of a crushing experience for D&D &D for her, which was too bad because, you know, I was one of my best players. <laughs> um, and then my brother, uh, the one in the middle, right? He, his favorite character, not necessarily his most powerful character, but he told me the other day when we were talking, his favorite character, he made a guy named Dude, just Dude the Barbarian. And Dude was just hilarious. My brother just had a great time with the guy. He was just a total joke, and we just laughed around all the time. And the guy was just a complete idiot. My brother just always did, like, just the funnest and dumbest things with him all the time, right? So, like, we'd be playing, and Dude would always suggest things, like, 
maybe we should split up and cover more ground and stuff, you know? And, and the funny thing was some people would actually agree. They'd be like, oh, that's a good idea. And my brother, you could just see on his face, he's like, no, that's a terrible idea. Never listen to anything dude ever says. Every idea I ever have on this character is guaranteed to be a terrible idea. But, you know, he wouldn't say that, right? You could just tell that he was thinking it, though. And people were like, oh, yeah, great idea. We can cover way more territory that way. And then, of course, half the party would die or whatever. But dude would never die, it seemed. But eventually, well, actually, that's not true, because eventually dude did die, and we couldn't resurrect him, but we did have a druid with the reincarnation spell. And for those of you not familiar with reincarnation, it is kind of like a resurrection spell, but your soul comes back in a different body. And so dude came back as a Gith Yankee. And the reason dude became my brother's favorite character, partly he just thought it was funny being a Gith Yankee. Oh, by the way, uh, for those of you who don't know, that's a Gith Yankee right there. Anyways, uh, they're kind of ugly. But anyways, uh, this became his favorite character, though. And part of the reason was because we ended up having this really, again, high-level, epic, Justice League-style uh, storyline where Dude... Because Dude was like... I think Dude was chaotic good or something, or something like that. Dude was good alignment, though, and he wasn't, like, neutral or evil like so many of the Gith Yankees seem to be. And Dude really wanted to, like, kind of save the Gith Yankee, so he decides the problem is the Gith Yankee queen, I think she is. Basically, she's like a lesser, lesser goddess. Maybe it's a king. I can't remember. But I'm pretty sure it's a queen. Anyways, he decides she's the problem. So we get all the high-level characters together, and we go on this huge excursion into Limbo with, like, ten guys, and, you know, all of us in the 30s and stuff. And... It just ends up being this huge epic thing where we're like we're fighting all these slad and we're fighting like all these like demons and stuff in limbo and whatnot and fighting like tons of Gith Yankees. But eventually we end up killing the Gith Yankee Queen and dude declares himself the new Gith Yankee King. And it was a kind of cool story. And also I liked the fact that that my brother had a vision for dude that wasn't just like dude I'm gonna like kill him and or kill her and then I'm gonna be the king. But he actually had this idea for this, like, you know, he wanted to, like, change the path of the Gith Yankee race, essentially, and kind of lead them on a better path. And I really like that aspect of his character. But anyways, those were, like, you know, some of the big characters that, you know, my brothers and sisters and I had played, right? Um, but then eventually, uh, I ended up moving to California for a couple of years, like I mentioned. I had uh, some roommates there. And it turned out a couple of them had played D&D. One used to play D&D a lot, just like me. The other one had only played like 10 or 12 game sessions, but he really enjoyed it. And we wanted to try to... We were thinking about maybe getting into Dungeons & Dragons, right? But the problem was, I could kind of tell one of the other guys really wanted to kind of like use his old characters. And me and the other guy didn't really like that. We wanted to like kind of start new with a new group. And that was when we discovered... Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, which seemed like the perfect solution to me. Because now we could all start a new game together, and we could all play that with new characters, and you didn't have to worry about people bringing characters in from other games, and you're like, how did your little six guy get the Wand of Orcus? Like, how did that happen? You know, some weird dungeon mastering going on there, right? Not that I was any better, by the way, just to be clear. But, you know, by this point I was like, you know, 19, 20, I think I was 20 when we started playing Fat Warhammer. Um, and so we started playing that, and I remember uh, we all kind of thought it would be like D&D, right? Uh, it didn't use classes, it used like skill-based systems, and you'd basically have like your old career that you were leaving and now you're becoming an adventurer, and you'd roll to see what that career was. So I remember my first character ever was a Dwarven Gravedigger, and I literally, for my starting equipment, I had a dagger, a shovel, and a leather vest that didn't even cover my arms or legs, or head, of course. And in Warhammer, they actually had hit locations. So you'd have different parts of armor for different parts of your body, right? So that leather vest literally only protected my torso. And it was like one point of armor for my torso. It was not very good. And I remember uh, we do our first adventure. Everybody in the party dies except for my dwarf, who goes insane and ends up getting a chaos mutation. And he grows this like mouth in the middle of his forehead, and he goes running into the forest to feed like squirrels and insects and stuff to the mouth. And I just remember just being like, 
this is Dungeons and Dragons. This game was terrible. And we were just horrified by our first session of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. Like, what on earth is this game? We thought it was going to be like D&D. But, you know, we persever persevered and made more characters and had a good time. And eventually had some characters that became fairly powerful in that game, too, you know. I remember um, I got into Vampire the Masquerade with some friends. And I made a character by the name of Edward Shaw. And this was really when I started discovering what true role-playing was. And, you know, by now I'm in, like, my mid-20s. And I've got a good group of guys who are all, like, really into role-playing. And I remember, like, there would be game sessions. We'd get together on, like, a Saturday. We'd play for 13 hours. And there were times where we did not roll a single dice all night. And we'd be having, like, you know... I remember once we, we ordered pizza, right, so everybody else is on break. And me and one of the other players... He's playing a guy named Franklin. So we got Franklin and Edward. And we're outside talking. And it's the middle of summer, so it's nice and warm and stuff. And we're talking for like an hour in character the entire time. We never broke character. You know, it, it didn't even matter to us, right? And we, I remember we went to like uh, the street festival one year. Again, it was in the middle of summer. And the whole time... Um, we're like plotting and planning and figuring out how we're going to like, you know, we'd all read The Prince by Machiavelli at this point and Vampire was a game with a lot of politics. So we're trying to figure out like how to improve our power and our standing and which like of the other rival factions we think maybe we can drive a wedge into and stuff. And we really got into the idea of actually like role playing characters and uh, that was a really fun game. And then of course from there we played a lot of, you know, we played like Mage and we played a bunch of the other stuff. I even tried Exalted briefly, which was fun. Just the group kind of fell apart, and, you know, that was that. Um, we really got into a lot of the White Wolf games. And uh, then, like I said, I, I remember I played Rifts in college a couple of times. That was okay. You know, and just kind of experimenting with some other games here and there. I played GURPS. I played, like, Mutants and Master Minds. I played GURPS Supers, you know, a few things. But it was more like a game session here. Or maybe we played two or three times, and that was it, right? We didn't really, like... You know, I like a lot of these other games, but it was just really hard to find a good, consistent group. And then I got into my late 20s, and everybody kind of moved apart and kind of stopped gaming. And then I was like, you know what? Maybe I should actually, like, concentrate on being an adult, uh, getting a real job, finding a girlfriend, and, uh, you know, being, being a real person for a bit, right? Uh, of course, that was a terrible idea, but I tried it anyways. Uh, so I remember, you know... Uh, going to the bar a bunch of times with a uh, bunch of my friends and stuff like that. You know, it was it was fun, but you know, ultimately pointless, essentially. Oh, I shouldn't say that, because I did meet the girl who introduced me to my wife at the bar. So, that wasn't entirely pointless. But anyways, um, so like I said, I didn't play anything at all for like a 15, 16 year stretch at one point there. Uh, I remember, um, I played a lot of video games, right? Like, I played EverQuest back in the day. I played a lot of World of Warcraft and stuff. And, uh, you know, kind of always gravitated to, like, these RPG-type and MMO-type RPGs in general. I just kind of liked that style of game, you know? And, uh, well, like I said, didn't play anything for a good stretch of time. And I started working at the place where I'm still working now. And I remember there were a couple guys talking. And I kind of knew the one guy because we both drove a forklift together, right? But we weren't really friends at that point yet. But I hear him and this other guy, and they're talking about Vampire the Masquerade. So after they were done, I kind of went to the one guy, and I'm like, hey, you know, I heard you guys talk about Vampire the Masquerade. I used to actually play a lot of Vampire, you know, like, quite a while ago, but, you know, whatever, right? And we started talking about that, and um, the two of us started, you know, just kind of talk about role-playing in general. I told him about, like, uh, I told him about some of my characters in my Warhammer Fantasy roleplay campaign, because some of our adventures there were hilarious and ridiculous. And, you know, he really liked that kind of stuff. And then about like a month later, he comes to me and he says, Hey, I'm thinking of starting a game of Shadowrun. Would you be interested? And I was like, man, yeah. Like, I've never played Shadowrun, but, you know, I'm familiar with the setting. I, I know of the game, of course, right? Uh, it's been around forever as well. And I was like, yeah, you know, that sounds like fun, right? And uh, so we get together, we start playing with him. This was right after I'd gotten married as well. And uh, I remember I'd come home from game night, and then my wife would want to know, like, the next day, like, what, what we did and what the story was, right? So I'd always be, you know, telling her about our adventures and stuff. And then, you know, after a few months of this, I was just like, maybe I'll just ask George if you can play. Like, is that something you'd like to do? And she's like, yeah, that actually sounds fun, right? So I go to George. I'm like, hey, 
uh, my wife's kind of interested in playing. Uh, do you think that would be okay? And he was like, I was going to ask you if that would be something she would be interested in. Because I've heard you talk about how like, sometimes she'll ask you about our games and stuff like that, right? He said, I meant to ask you, and I just keep slipping my mind. So sure enough, she starts playing with us. We played Shadowrun for a few years, and uh, it was a really, really great campaign for a long time. Unfortunately, it ended terribly, but I will say, like, George was one of the one of the best, like, storytelling type dungeon masters, game masters, I've ever played with. He would just describe a setting or a situation, a room, and it was so vivid in your mind. He was amazing at that kind of stuff. And um, it, was, it was a great experience overall. Uh, like I said, unfortunately, the campaign ended terribly, uh, not with player deaths, but more with uh, him getting impatient with the players not knowing what we were supposed to do in time. So he had a bunch of NPCs come in and save the day, which was just not satisfying for him or us. And left a bitter taste in everybody's mouth. But he seemed to realize, too, that, like, yeah, that was, that was a bad move. I just got frustrated with you guys. And it's like, eh, fair enough. You know, we clearly weren't picking up what he was putting down, right? But um, then he was like, you know... And, and, like, by this point, a lot of the original Shadowrun guys had actually kind of left. And we had a bunch of newer players, right? And he's like, we got some new guys who've literally only played, like, one game. And that was Shadowrun. And, by the way, Shadowrun is not an easy game to pick up. I really love Shadowrun. But, like, making a character in Shadowrun is, it's like one of the 12 feats of Hercules or something, you know? It's almost impossible to do, it seems. Uh, it is like an all-day process. You're not going to sit down and make up a character in five minutes, right? It just doesn't happen, essentially. Even veteran Shadowrun players, it takes some time, right? But if you're like a newbie, like, good luck. You know, it's just, uh, it's, it's awful. The game is very crunchy as well. And that can be really difficult for some new players. And so he's like, you know... I've been looking online and I've been hearing a lot of good things about D&D 5th Edition. And he's like, you know, it sounds like people really like the game. It's having some of its like most profitable years ever. Like, even better than the 80s, right? And, you know, he's like, a lot of people seem to really like the game. We got some newer guys. Some of them don't really understand, like, some of the systems in Shadowrun that well. And you have to explain it to them all the time. It's like, I think we should try D&D. &D. And, like, the other campaign just ended. We'd actually technically played a game or two of the new campaign, but it just wasn't really the same. The magic was kind of gone at that point. And he's like, you know, I think we should move and try some D&D &D 5th edition. And I was like, man, that actually sounds pretty cool. Let's give it a shot. So, of course, we all bought books, started playing D&D &D 5th edition. Eventually, uh, you know, uh, he ended up having to leave because he ended up moving back out east again. And, you know, other people ended up running games. I started running games and stuff. And, you know, this is kind of where we've been ever since. And, you know, we have played more Shadowrun since then. We've dabbled in a couple other games. I tried to get the group to play some Dungeon Crawl Classics because it's like old school D&D, &D basically. Uh, but the death count was pretty high and some of the players didn't like that. That's my one big complaint about 5th edition. Well, the old editions were, like, really harsh and brutal, and death was, like, constantly lurking around every corner. In 5th edition, once you get past, like, level 2 or 3, death is almost never a thing, it seems. And, like, by, by the time clerics are, like, level 5, they can get revivify. And so even player death, when it does happen, is really not a big of a deal. A lot of the save-or-die mechanics have all been, like, removed from the game, essentially, you know. Now it's like... Oh, you fight the Medusa, you fail your saving throw. It's like, oh, so I got turned to stone? Huh, no, no. Uh, first you're, like, slowed, and, you know, then you're kind of, like, paralyzed, and then if you fail a third time, then you're turned to stone, you know? And like, it's like, oh, okay, so I just have to make, like, a saving throw at any point here. And like, yeah, 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 don't worry about it, you'll be fine, you know? Uh, and I do find that, like, coming from that background where players are dying constantly, it does seem like they're... There needed to be a, a better middle ground between constant player death and no player death. Mine is, you know, somewhere in that middle, right? But overall, I really like 5th edition. I think that they managed to, like, really streamline a lot of the complicated rules and gave us a system that was, like, fun and also fast, but is also um, has a lot of, like, depth to it, too. You, anytime you start stripping away rules and trying to simplify games... You always get concerned and like strip out some of the depth, and they really didn't. And I think a lot of the multi-classing and stuff is actually like 
way more involved now than it was before, but it also makes it really fascinating and interesting. And that's one of the reasons I love multi-classes so much. And, you know, I just like really like that kind of stuff, right? And, uh, you know, what can I say? Uh, I've had multiple campaigns in 5th edition so far that have gone to high levels as well. This isn't really meant to be a video about high-level gameplay. But I do find, like, a lot of people always talk about how D&D, like, breaks down after, like, 11th level or whatever, right? And high-level gameplay just isn't very good, so you don't do it, right? But, like I said, maybe because all of my favorite uh, game moments when I was young were us, like, doing things like killing Loth, Queen of the Demon Web Pits. Great adventure, you know? Great adventure for me, anyway. A lot of people hated it because we lost, like, five or six parties in there before we ever finally found a group that was good enough to kill her, too, by the way. That was another one with a high body count. Uh, but anyways, neither here nor there. But like I said, I, I liked the big, like, demigod type of, of status of some of our characters. And we would challenge them by throwing them against, like, actual gods and demon lords and stuff like that all the time, right? And we used a lot of the uh, optional rules from... Uh, deities and demigods, where things like demon lords and archdevils and stuff counted as lesser gods and had doubled the hit points in their home planes, right? So we'd beef them up to make them more powerful because by this point we kind of figured, like, yeah, turns out wizards with 400 hit points and 24 in all their stats is uh, insane and we never should have allowed this. But, it's, you know, what do you do now, right? You can't, you know, once the toothpaste is out of the tube, too late to go back, essentially. We could have started all over again, but nobody wanted to do that. Those were our favorite characters at this point, you know? And my opinion was, uh, we just need bigger villains then, you know? Like I said, Superman doesn't fight Bane, he fights Darkseid. So, you know, that's what the Justice League needs to do. We fight those kind of guys. Avengers fight Thanos, you know? They're not they're not dealing with some guy robbing a bank, right? They're, they're fighting the guy with the Infinity Gauntlet, right? And if your characters are Thor, God of Thunder, Captain Marvel, and, you know... Doctor Strange, you know, you fight Thanos. <laughs> That's just the way I looked at it. So to me, it was just like, yeah, this is fine. Who cares? You know, it's just higher levels. But it's the same type of idea still. And just the players have more options. The monsters have way more abilities. But, you know, it's fine. Uh, and that was how we ran our games. We just didn't know any better, right? But I still love those big, like, epic feels and big epic storylines, even to this day. So like I said, I've had multiple campaigns that have all gone to like level 18 plus or even 20 at this point. And, you know, it's fine. <laughs> I love it. Um, anyways, uh, so a few of like a few of my like favorite adventures and stuff. I remember uh, mentioning this story at once too. But I remember we played, one of the guys we played with all the time, his name was Ryan. And this was probably the only game we ever played at Ryan's house because his parents were kind of mean. We didn't like them much. We were afraid of them. Uh, but one night, we ended up playing at Ryan's house, and it was the only time ever. And I remember, um, I think there was only three of us at the beginning, right? So there's me, him, and our buddy Arno, and I'm running the adventure. So they're running like a couple characters each, and I even had a character because we just didn't have a lot of players. And that's one thing you notice. Like, a lot of these adventures, these things are all designed for, like, you know, parties of, like, six to ten players, right? Four, four to seven, six to ten... 8 to 10 players, uh, you know, the idea back then was that, you know, you just got a huge group together and, you know, you have three fighters, a couple clerics, a couple rogues, some magic users and whatever else you needed. To, you know, maybe you'd substitute a fighter for a paladin if you had one, but I'm uh, rolling up a paladin back then was not an easy thing to do. You needed like 17 charisma and it capped at 18 and, you, you know, you had to actually roll that on your dice, right? So, I mean, that wasn't easy, but... You know, so we'd have, but we did have it happen just because we had, you know, 30 characters each, right? Sooner or later, you're bound to roll high. But anyways, um, you know, that's just kind of how the game was. You'd have, like, multiple characters of all these different classes, and you just have a 10-person party, right? So when I say we invaded things like, like the Nine Hells of the Abyss with 10 or 12 players, that was kind of the expectation back then. You know, your average party was, like, eight guys. You know, you're going to try to kill, like, Queen of the Gives Yankee, you better take a couple extras, you know, at least two extra. So, you know, that's just how it was, right? But uh, I remember, um, like I said, like, keep on the borderlands to this day, even though I wouldn't say it's necessarily the greatest adventure of all time or anything like that. I have so many fond, great memories of that. It was my first adventure we ever played, my first D&D &D 
experience, and that one always has a special place in my heart. But my absolute favorite, like I said, we're over at my buddy Ryan's place, and we're playing Ravenloft, right? And I remember we finished the adventure, and everything's like just dead quiet. And usually I'd be like, okay, what do you guys think, you know? And, and so I asked him that, and nobody says anything. And I was like, man, I thought this game was great. Like, how come nobody's saying anything? Did they hate it? Like, like what happened, you know? Like, I thought this was one of the best games ever. And then finally, like, Ryan's just like, he just looks up, and he's like, that could be the greatest adventure ever. Like, like a couple of the ones we made ourselves, and this. He's like, this is the best store-bought adventure, hands down, and one of the best we've ever, ever played. And then you're like, Arnold agreed, and I'm just like, yeah, I think so too. And that was our first experience with Ravenloft, right? Just just an epic adventure. And, uh, you know, we absolutely loved it. Like I said, um, I remember my brother, all my brother's adventures were just ridiculous because he just, he just liked to have fun. And they were just some of the craziest adventures ever. I remember this one, he, he gives us the player map, and it's just a blank piece of paper with an X on it and like two squiggly lines, and that was the player map. And, and then like you look at his map, and it's like all detailed and stuff. <laughs> you know, he's got everything all mapped out, and our map is just two squiggly lines and an X. <laughs> you know, like that was the kind of stuff he'd do all the time, right? But he was really the first one that kind of started figuring out, well, if players with 400 hit points and like tons of high stats are super powerful, why couldn't we have villainous NPC groups with the same thing? Like, why not fight evil NPCs that are also 25th level wizards and have had wish spells every single day that they can cast with, you know, 10 months of downtime and, you know, whatever, right? And uh, those were some really fun adventures because we were fighting, like, other characters on our level, right? And usually, you know, the players would still win because we'd use better teamwork and stuff like that. And, you know, the Dungeon Master, even back then, we were trying to challenge our players, but most of us didn't want to kill them. We did have a couple experiences with killer DMs, but usually that wasn't the way we tried to run things. And a lot of times, our DMs would even be playing a character in the party because sometimes we just didn't have enough players, right? Or somebody would go home and then the DM would play that character for them while they were gone. And you didn't want to kill somebody's character just because they had to go home for supper, you know? Like, that's not fair, right? So, you know, all the times our players would be like playing stuff and running stuff at the same time. And, you know, everybody was taking turns at dungeon mastering. Like, somebody would buy an adventure and they're like, we're going to do this one. And somebody would be like, hey, and after we're doing this one that I just bought, you know? And somebody would be like, oh, man, I've made like this really cool story. We've got to do mine. And we're like, okay, you know? And so that's just the way it was. And like I said, everybody was playing, everybody was running stuff. It didn't really matter to us. The idea that, like, maybe dungeon masters shouldn't be playing characters on a regular basis. That kind of had occurred to us, but we didn't really care much back then. I try to avoid such things now. Even if I have the players like meet an NPC and that NPC is with the characters for a while, I always try to like remove them after that story arc part is done. Because, you know, I don't really want the players to be reliant on DM PCs, right? I, I don't really like it. Although I have people, had people complain, like, oh, wasn't this basically a DM PC then that you were running? And I was like... Uh, they were there for like four game sessions out of a hundred. I don't really consider that a DMPC if they're, you know, there for a month out of our two-year campaign that we played every week, you know. But, uh, whatever. But anyways, like I said, my brother's adventures were, well, it was just a ton of fun. I, I remember just, just always loving them. They were hilarious. And, uh, you know, even though uh, I don't think the Dragonlance... Uh, modules were as well written because they really wanted you to like play the Dragonlance characters from the books and kind of like relive their kind of experiences and stories and we were just more interested in playing our own characters and doing our own stuff a lot of times right but just because like some of them in particular were, were actually really good those are fun uh, basically anything by by Tracy and Laura Hickman or Tracy Hickman in general like, I remember, like, the, the Desert series, like, the Pharaoh and Lost Two and Martek, I think it was called, whatever else. Those adventures were incredible as well. All of his stuff was just really, really top tier. So even though I complain about the Dragonlance modules, I don't mean that to throw shade on, on him at all, because he, he was amazing. Like, he's the one who did Ravenloft as well. Just great stuff. And, uh, you know, like I said, I, I just had a lot of, like, great experiences with it over the years. 
Uh, it's funny because I remember talking to the guy who first first told me about D&D on that scouting trip back in the day, and he apologized about 10 times in that conversation for introducing me to D&D, which he thought was just the greatest waste of time of my entire life. And uh, he might be right, to be honest, although I would actually argue that video games are a far bigger waste of time, to be honest. Um, but the thing is, at the heart of it, it was just me and my, my, my brothers and sisters and a bunch of our friends getting together. We weren't causing any trouble. We weren't getting into trouble. Uh, we're just having fun every day. And like I said, it was something my parents approved of. My parents were like pretty religious. So you might think that during the whole like, um, you know, D&D scare in the 80s there with the satanic panic and all that, that they might have been concerned, but they really weren't at all, you know? I know there was a couple other people at church who kind of mentioned it, but my, A, my dad loved the Lord of the Rings and stuff too. Like that's one of the reasons I got into fantasy and science fiction is because my dad was into that stuff, right? And then they hadn't played with us a lot, but they'd seen the game a bit, they'd played a little bit, and they'd, they'd watch us play or overhear us play all the time. They knew it was just good, clean, wholesome fun. We weren't out there trying to sacrifice the neighbor's cat or anything like that, right? You know, so, they just never really bought into any of that. They were just like, meh, whatever. At least they're not, like, doing drugs and, you know, graffitiing up the school. Granted, it would have taken, like, you know, an hour to bike to the school to graffiti it. So that was just out of the question, in our opinion. But, uh, you know, I mean, like I said, it was just good, clean fun. And I think back on that, like, original D&D box that I got for my birthday there. I don't know if that... I mean, that was probably the greatest birthday present I ever got. I got more hours of enjoyment out of that and all the subsequent stuff that came from that than anything else, you know? Um, I do remember I had a great birthday when I was, uh, I believe I was turning 19, and that was a great birthday party as well. It was a surprise birthday party that my brother put together and stuff, and that was, that was great. Uh, but honestly, um, like I said, it was, it was just good, wholesome fun. Uh, a lot of the math skills that I still have with me to this day, my ability to quickly add up dice and add up numbers in my head, is all based about me playing Dungeons and Dragons and having to like add up dice constantly, right? Uh, that all came from there, you know? Um, and like I said, it was just good fun, and it was like, you know, stuff that I did with my, with my family members, and you know, we were like really close and stuff because of that stuff, right? Uh, completely unrelated note, but I remember my sister telling me, and this was, you know, when we were both adults, and she told me uh, one of the favorite member she, memories she ever had as a kid was uh, we were playing basketball, like just pick up basketball with a bunch of my friends just once, right? And one of the guys complained, he's like, Rob, why do you always bring your sister with you? And I was like, because uh, I like doing stuff with my sister. And I didn't think much of it, but to her, it was like this big deal, because I like stood up for her in front of all my friends would have been it would have been really easy to just be like oh yeah you know my mom and dad maybe bring her or something else right and I was just like my sister was awesome why wouldn't I want to do stuff with her and so she told me that as an adult and I'd completely forgotten and I was like man like that kind of stuff all came about because I spent so much time with them when we were kids playing these kind of games you know and it was cooperative gaming. It wasn't like Monopoly or Risk where we're trying to beat each other. We're all getting mad at each other. We're working together as a team with a common goal. And, uh, you know, I look back at it now and they were just great experiences. So, did I spend a lot of time on D&D? Yeah. Do I still probably spend too much time on it? I mean, maybe. I don't know. But now I have a D&D channel, so I, you know, I kind of justify it that way. I, I need to spend time on it. You know, that's what I'm doing now, right? But, Honestly, like I said, it was good, wholesome fun, and it was a great bonding experience for me and friends and stuff. It's stuff that I still think back on occasionally, even to this day, and have fond memories of. And you know, often at work, when I'm like doing my menial job, I'm thinking about ideas for adventures that I want to run and plotting out like NPCs and campaigns and stuff and putting things together in my brain because, you know, I just get bored at work. So what else am I going to think about? I think about RPGs. That's what I do. And, you know, so, like I said, it's been almost 40 years. That's kind of been my journey. Started with D&D, played a lot of other stuff, other stuff that I haven't even mentioned, like Primal Order or whatever else, you know. But, well, yeah, we got some Palladium in there. What else we got on the shelf? Uh, we got some actual Warhammer. <laughs> Not just Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, the, like Dice or the a miniature game. You know, a lot of that kind of stuff. But, like I said, started with D&D, and we've kind of come back full circle. And I'm really glad that D&D is in a good place these days, you know? 
Uh, I might have nitpicks with some of the rules here and there and some of the balance. I might think counter spells kind of too powerful, for example. I might complain that characters don't die enough these days. But the truth is, it's still a great game and it's a lot of fun. And I'm really, really happy that it seems to be doing so well still. And that, uh, you know, I've been doing videos about it for a while now and still haven't run out of stuff to talk about. So I think that's pretty awesome. But anyways, hopefully you enjoyed this video. I realize it's a completely different type of video, but you know, that's okay. I think that's, that's fine to have sometimes too. And hopefully uh, it's been entertaining or interesting or little things you might've heard that you're like, ooh, I kind of like that. Or, oh wow, that's kind of weird. Like, or man, I can't believe you guys let people wish for more hit points. That sounds like a terrible idea. And by the way, it was a terrible idea. I'm glad that Wish is a much better spell these days than it was back then. But, you know, that was also partly uh, TSR's fault for not putting good guidelines in place. Because <laughs> obviously people were going to abuse it. Come on, man. And if I could wish for a higher strength or higher constitution, it just made sense we could wish for more hit points. But it turns out that, you know, like I said, a ring of three wishes is not a big deal. A wizard with wish spell every day or two wishes a day or three wishes a day is uh is terrible <laughs> so you know it is what it is though but anyways that's everything i have thanks for watching i'd love to hear your comments and feedback in the comment section that's my favorite thing about having a youtube channel is reading people's comments and interacting with them of course but uh anyways thanks for watching feel free to like subscribe ring the bell for notifications and all that kind of stuff all the youtube things and uh,